I want to begin this message by quoting two passages from the New Testament with regard to the Old Testament scriptures. In Luke chapter 24, this is after the resurrection of Christ, we read in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Whatever is in the Old Testament scripture is concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them, in the Old Testament scriptures, the book of Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, from those scriptures, we know ahead of time that whatever the Old Testament is saying, its first application is to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I preach from a passage of scripture and do not preach the gospel from that passage of scripture, I have misunderstood that scripture and failed in my uh, responsibility as a preacher. All scriptures testify of him. And really, this is our rule of interpretation with regard to every passage of scripture in the Old Testament, including the one I just read, with regard to these prophecies regarding the sons of Jacob, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I'm not talking about forcing something on it that's not there, but I mean preaching the gospel from that passage of scripture. And so we know ahead of time, even if we don't know what the scripture means, we know what it means, don't, don't we? It means the gospel and may the Lord give us wisdom to uh, deal with the gospel from this. Now back in Genesis 49, The first three of Jacob's sons that were mentioned were Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. And if you'll remember, nothing good was said about any of them. Nothing good. And then we have Judah. We considered that a couple of weeks ago, the prophecy concerning Judah. And it's really a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, we have the eight sons after Judah, and nothing but good is spoken concerning them. Now, we learn the gospel right there, don't we? Verse 13, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. And he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. Now, like I said, if all I get out of that is uh, he represents a haven, a port where there were safety from the storms. Uh, ships would arrive and be safe. Now, this is speaking of Christ, my haven. Christ, my hiding place. Christ, my safe place. We're called upon to abide in Christ. That's abiding in a place. And in that place, there's nothing but safety and security. That's why Paul said, oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him. I don't want to be found anywhere else. That's the only place of safety. I've said this a dozen times before, probably more than that, but I'll say it again. I'd rather just simply be in Christ than be, to be found reading the Bible or praying or witnessing or preaching or doing good works. Just let me be found in Christ. 
That's the only place I want to be found. He is the haven. He is the place of safety and rest. Don't look for rest and safety anywhere, but simply being found in Christ, being in the house with the blood over the door, being in the ark. That's the safe place, the haven, Christ Jesus. Now let's go on reading. And Issachar is a strong ass, couching, being stretched is the word, couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant. And he bowed his shoulder to bear and become a servant unto tribute. He became a debtor. Now, let's think of Issachar. He's a strong ass couching between two burdens. And that word burden is taken out of the root word, which means entwined. Entwined. Now, I don't have any question. I think this is what this scripture is alluding to. You can't teach directly from this. This is more of an example or an illustration. But every believer is couched between two burdens, two weights. And you know what those burdens are. Uh, the flesh and the spirit. Somebody may think, well, how could you consider the spirit a burden? Well, you wouldn't even know it's a burden without the spirit. The spirit lets us know that he's a He's couched between these two burdens, and it's, that's the believer's experience. Number one is what the Scripture teaches. Romans 7, that's so clear. Paul said the flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit lusts against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other. Every believer is two separate men coming through one consciousness. And that's what makes this so difficult. I mean, it is, you can't say, well, this was spirit, that was flesh. You have one consciousness, you have one man, and every believer has these two burdens within this one man. I mean, even in uh, the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite said, I'm a company of two armies, two armies. She recognized that in Romans chapter seven, the, flood, the story of the flesh and the story of the spirit, that's my experience. It's what the scripture teaches, but as much as uh, well, that's what's number one important, but what's number two important is that is my experience. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, he was, a, he was intertwined with these two burdens, and it's only this man that can see that rest is good. Verse 15. There's no understanding this apart from uh, knowing the burden of sin. That man sees that rest is good. Now, when you rest, you rest in response to the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing for you to do. He did it all. And rest is good. There remaineth a rest for the people of God, a Sabbath of rest for the people of God. For he that's entered into his rest hath ceased from his own works. What a blessed thing to cease from your own works and enter into his glorious work. Verse 15, he saw that rest was good and that and the land of rest was, I'm putting rest in there, it says the land, that it was pleasant. Oh, it's, it's so pleasant to be in that place of rest. It's a joyous thing, the joy and peace of believing. And he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Now somebody says, how can that be a good thing? To become a servant to tribute. I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor. A debtor to his grace. A debtor to his gospel. 
a debtor to his love. When I stand before thy throne dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Now, this is the one debt I love, being a debtor to grace. I don't owe anything else, but I tell you this, I'm a debtor to his grace. And he, Issachar, sees that, and really it's only the man who's couched between these two burdens that sees the sweetness of rest and is a debtor to his grace. Verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan means judgment. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heel, so that the rider shall fall backwards. Dan shall judge his people. I love to think about the judgment of the cross. It was a thing, yes, of grace, yes, of love, but it was a thing of absolute judgment and justice. And because of what Christ bore on the cross when he bore my sin and he bore the wrath of God, God's sentence against sin, judgment is accomplished. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I am completely free of any kind of judgment. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God justified them. Cleared of all guilt. The state of justification is a state of sinlessness. And that is what the Lord brings to his people. Absolute judgment and justice. And the scripture I thought of when I thought of this is uh, Romans, uh, I mean, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Not merciful and gracious, although he is, but he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, he's merciful and gracious in doing that, but he's faithful in that he determined to do it before time began, and he's living up to his faithfulness, and it's done in a way that glorifies his justice. Dan, judgment. Oh, the justice of the gospel. I love it. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Oh, the righteousness and justice of the gospel. This, there's nothing unclean about this. Um, I think of um, Romans 5, 20 and 21, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin had reigned into death, even so might grace reign through righteousness. It's righteous, just grace. There's nothing unclean about it. It is all measures up to a perfect balance and a perfect weight. Dan, judgment. And look what it says about Dan. <clears throat> Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heel so that the rider shall fall backward. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Now, do you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was the serpent hanging on the pole? He took upon himself us. We, we, were the, we were bit by the serpents. He became the serpent hanging on the pole. And I think of the prophecy regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what said to the serpent? You shall bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. And this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, causes everyone that he arrests by his grace to fall backwards, to fall off their high horse, to fall off their position of pride and look to Christ only. They got nowhere else to look. And when you're knocked off your horse and are made to see what you really are, you won't have anywhere to look but to Christ. And what a blessing that is when the Lord brings somebody to that position. Verse 19. Verse 18 we considered last week. I've waited for thy salvation, O Lord. I think it's interesting. It's, it's like as Jacob is giving this prophecy, he takes a breather. He takes a breather. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now he picks up in verse 19, Gad, a troop shall overcome him 
but he shall overcome at last. Gad's, Gad's name means troop, and here is the experience of every believer. A troop shall overcome him. And that's my experience every day. Every day. I get overcome. Every time I sin, I've been overcome. A troop overcomes me. And that is the experience of every believer, every day, all the time. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 24, 16 says, For just man falleth seven times. What seven represent? All the time. All the time. In my experience, I can't say I've even kept one commandment one time. Not once. Not once. I love God's law. And when I'm saying this, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about some poor, defeated attitude. I, I'm, I'm a victor in Christ Jesus because notice what it says. It says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. That's true of every believer. When I'm saying this, I'm not... Uh, uh, rolling in pity and self. Uh, no, I'm just talking about the reality of every. I can't say I've ever gone a second without sin because I haven't kept one of God's commandments one time. I'm always in the state of, of not loving God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength and all my might. And I'm always in the state of not loving my neighbor as myself in and of myself. It's nonstop. And so I'm overcome every time I sin. But this is not a defeatist attitude. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And Christ has won my victory. I'm not saying this, giving in and just saying, what's the use? No, I'm going to overcome at last because Christ has won my victory for me. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. And even in my defeats, God is using them for my good and his glory. That's what Romans 8, 28 says. We know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 20. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Now, Asher's name means blessed. Happy, blessed. Oh, if I'm a believer, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing. Not most of them, all of them. That is the possession of every believer. And you want to talk about blessed. Now, I uh, don't much like Please understand me. I hate it when somebody says I'm not happy. So don't say that around me. Uh, I, I just, it just aggravates me. I'm not happy. Well, uh, and I'm not being, um, I'm not being, somebody said, boy, he's hard-hearted and callous. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. It, the, happiness is based on circumstances. If my circumstances are good, I'm happy. Uh, if I'm not happy, and I say, I'm not happy. Watch out. Heads are getting ready to roll because I'm going to do whatever it takes to make myself happy. And in that sense, I just, um, happy. I, you know, somebody says, I, I'm not happy. Well, do what's right. Don't do what you think is going to make you happy. Do what's right. You'll be fine. But this is much better, being blessed. Being blessed by God. And listen to how our Lord, Asher means blessed. He's the one who has these royal dainties. Blessed, blessed by God are the poor in spirit. That's God's blessing. To have nothing to recommend you to God, absolutely nothing. You're blessed of God. Blessed are they that mourn. This is so contrary to what the flesh thinks. This mourning is mourning over what? Sin. Sin. You're always mourning over sin. My sin is ever before me, David said, and I am mourning over sin. And I think this is interesting. I, here's a little uh, grammar lesson. 
Blessed are they that mourn. That's in the present tense, active voice. It's a participle. That means it's what you are, present tense, and it's what you do. You're one who mourns, and you mourn all the time. And that's blessed. Remember, it's only the one who mourns that's going to be comforted. They shall be comforted with the comforts of the gospel. Blessed are the meek. This is who Christ calls blessed. Blessed are the meek. Those who count whatever God does as right, holy, just, and good. Meek before God. This is an attitude before God. This is, this is not really uh, an attitude toward men, although it comes out. But it's an attitude toward God where you believe everything he does is right. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know the only reason you hunger and thirst is because you know in and of yourself you don't have any. And you have to have him give it to you. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's the new heart he gives. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Happy. Blessed. Now that's, that's true happiness, being blessed by God. Happiness isn't having a lot of money in the bank and, and health. I'm thankful for uh, any money the Lord gives me that uh, I can buy my food and so on, and I'm thankful for health. I know what it is to be sick, but uh, the, the, that's not blessing. Spiritual blessings are the blessings that come from God. And Asher, or out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Oh, the royal dainties of the gospel being justified, being preserved. Being loved by God, being given faith, being given repentance when you're continually in a state of a change of mind before God. What a blessing, every blessing of the gospel. Naphtali is a hind let loose, he giveth goodly words. Now, a deer set free. This is talking about freedom, liberty. He's a deer set free. Now, what is liberty? What is it to be set free? Number, it's two things. It's number one, to not owe anything. To not owe anything. And number two, it's to do what you want to do. I don't owe anything to God's law. I stand perfect before God's law. And when I say you get to do what you want it to do, uh, the first person I actually, well, Janine wasn't in here, but the first person I ever heard say that was her dad, Bill Clark. He says, here's the gospel. Trust Christ and do what you want to do. Now, I've heard people say, well, that's, that'll lead to sin. No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. The, the, the believer wants to follow him. A believer, I wanted to die myself. I want to take up my cross. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. I want to be like him. I want to be gracious. I want to be merciful. I want to be non-judgmental. I want to be a true friend. I want to love my neighbor. As my, I will trust Christ to do what you want to do. Well, that, well that's good. Trust Christ, and you're set free. Now, I, uh, he's a hind let loose. And to me, the best illustration of what liberty really is is the year of Jubilee. Now, I want you to think about you lose everything, and you have to become a slave. Talking about changing lifestyle. What if all of a sudden you, uh, tomorrow, had to become somebody's slave because you couldn't pay your debts, and you were a slave and you had to do what that person told you to do, and you, you'd had it. Now, in the scripture, there's something called the year of Jubilee. It took place every 50 years. But on that year of Jubilee, and I think this is very significant, we don't have one example of it ever being observed. Not once. You were supposed to, but there's not one time of it ever being observed, because you think about it. 
If somebody owed you $10,000 and that silver trumpet would blow and all of a sudden they didn't owe you anymore. I mean, the people that were, uh, had the money were the people that had the supposed power is what they think. And they're going to do everything they can to keep Jubilee from being observed. And if somebody owed me a lot of money, I wouldn't like the year of Jubilee. You wouldn't either. You know who liked it? The slaves. They loved it. The people who were in debt and couldn't take care of their debts, they loved it. Now, on the year of Jubilee, you were set free. You were no longer a slave. All your debts were canceled. You're set free. Everything you lost was restored. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter 25. Everything you lost was given back to you. And you were given a year's vacation. It'd be pretty sweet after you've been a slave for who knows how many years. The ground was given rest. No crops, no, no work. A year's vacation. <clears throat> Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. The words of the gospel. How, how goodly are the words of the gospel. Now he talks about Joseph. More time is devoted to Joseph. Joseph, well, I think of the fruit of the Spirit. He's fruitful. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. That's talking about his brothers, the things that he's experienced. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. What a name for our Redeemer. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessings of thy father hath prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, unto eternity. These are eternal blessings. Fruitfulness. Do you know every believer has this fruit he's speaking of? The fruit of God the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I love God. I love His salvation. I love His people. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Doesn't it make you rejoice to know that everything God requires of you, you have in Christ? Do you rejoice in that? And the peace that comes from that. Now the next three are our attitude towards others. The fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. That's the way we are to be toward everybody else. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. And the third branch of the fruit has to do with ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit is faith, meekness, temperance, control from within. Every believer has the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is so beautiful. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The fruit of God, the Holy Spirit. He's, he's fruitful. They shall be on the head of Joseph. Last part of verse 26. And on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Joseph was so separate from that other bunch, wasn't he? And he represents Christ Jesus the Lord. On his head were many crowns. And then we have Benjamin. Verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now this is talking about the appetite of Benjamin. Now what's the fourth beatitude? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, 
Here's one of the mysteries of the gospel. I'm satisfied. I'm not looking for anything else. I'm not looking for something better. There isn't anything better. I'm complete in Christ and I'm satisfied with that. God's satisfied with Jesus Christ and I'm satisfied with Him too. And I'm satisfied to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm satisfied. I'm not hungering for anything else. Yet I'm called upon to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I don't ever want to be one of those complacent people that are not hungry anymore. Like the Laodiceans who were rich and increased in goods and had need of nothing. I want to continually hunger and thirst after the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the line in O sacred head now wounded. The writer says, O make me thine forever, but should I fainting be, O let me never, never outlive my love to thee. I want to be like Benjamin, like a wolf eating his prey, uh, feeding on the Lord Jesus Christ, always hungering, always thirsting after him. I, I, oh, may the Lord deliver me from anything but this, hungering and thirsting after Jesus Christ the Lord. Now he says we're guarding these boys, verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now this is, this is the church. This is the church. The first three, well, we know about them. Judah, we know about him. And what these boys now are through the work of Judah, every one of these boys represents some aspect of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, like I said, this is, this is a, a prophecy, a genealogy, and if I can't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from it, I've not understood it. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that we might enter in to the haven. Lord, how we thank you for the burdens that make us see that rest is good. How we thank you for the blessedness of your gospel. Lord, we ask that we might exemplify all these things. And Lord, please, for Christ's sake, give us that continual hunger and thirst after your righteousness. Bless this message for your glory and our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.